it was a great honour to have been invited by Lady Brewer there to uh, deliver this uh, Gresham College lecture as part of the City of London's uh, 2014 festival. And let me start, Paul and Tessa, in congratulating you on your foresight in arranging this lecture to take place on the only evening for weeks when there's no World Cup television coverage. <laughs> Amazing. Giving this uh, lecture means a, a great deal to me, not only because of the um, distinguished list of previous lecturers, but because in 1956 I won a Middlesex County scholarship to attend Mercer's School. And at that time, this was the only school within the boundaries of the square mile. Now, the, the school no longer exists, um, but it was then located in rather cramped uh, premises just through that archway that you passed on the way here, um, and immediately behind this uh, hall, Barnard's Inn, of course, one of the old inns of court, um, our playground was a bomb site left over from the war, and these premises have been occupied by Gresham College since 1991. So this part of the Barnards Inn um, has not changed under the new ownership, and I can still vividly recall waiting in this hall uh, before being ushered into the headmaster's study next door to be interviewed for entry by the then headmaster, Mr. Hayden, and I've just noticed that his name is up on that board, and I remember him giving me a hard time, but anyway, he let me in. And there was another boy sitting in this hall um, with me in 1956, and I'm delighted that John Bradford, uh, sitting over there, is with us um, tonight. Now, another uh, coincidence was that uh, once in the school, I was placed in a house named Gresham after the Lord Mayor of London in 1537-38. He was, of course, the great benefactor who provided the money which even today endows the work of Gresham College. So at the very early age of 11, I knew all about one of London's most successful Lord Mayors, and I can assure you that there weren't many others of my generation who knew the name of Thomas Gresham. But my first awareness of career came uh, even earlier, and I can date it almost exactly uh, the time when I first heard about the Hermit Kingdom. It was, of course, during the Korean War. Um, and I vividly remember my dinner ladies in my primary school chiding any child who wasted food by reminding them of all the starving orphans in Korea. Now, I could never quite work out how finishing my plate would help my contemporaries in Korea, but it certainly left an indelible awareness of that remote country on the other side of the world. Given the scale of military participation and the loss of life, the Korean War made surprisingly little impact on the British public of the 1950s. Perhaps it was the absence of television coverage, perhaps it was the fact that we were distracted by the coronation of our new queen, but the truth, as many Korean War veterans will uh, testify, is that the Korean War became the Forgotten War. Those 82,000 British reservists and national servicemen who fought so gallantly in Korea came back to a country which really wasn't very interested in what they'd done. Now, nobody who's ever walked among the British graves in the UN cemetery in Busan will ever forget the sacrifices of those more than 1,000 young men so far from home. Their losses were greater uh, than anything we've seen over the last decade in Iraq and Afghanistan, and shamefully, no war memorial was erected in London. It took an initiative from the Korean government before last November's state visit by the Korean president to see her undertake a groundbreaking ceremony so that there will be a Korean War monument erected outside the Ministry of Defence alongside the embankment. And I'm really touched and honoured that this evening, we have five members of the British Korea War Veterans Association at the back, and I'm really grateful to you guys for coming along. Uh, it's a great honour. 
It's difficult, of course, for today's youngsters to realise just how remote East Asia was to my generation. Even when I was at university, uh, there were no direct flights to Japan or Korea, let alone to China. There was no internet access, there were hardly any Koreans living in Britain or British living in Korea, and there were certainly no Korean restaurants, films or cultural events. My first visit to the region was in 1966 when I received a travel scholarship from my college in Cambridge which allowed me to travel to Japan by the Trans-Siberian Railway and I spent that summer in Japan and I vividly recall meeting some American Peace Corps uh, workers who had been in Korea. The country they told me was a bottomless pit for US aid. Between 1953 and 1961, America had given approximately $2 billion in aid to South Korea, about 10% of GDP. But per capita incomes were lower than in Ghana or Sudan, and nothing seemed to get the economy going. Even North Korea in those days was growing more rapidly. And I always remember those Americans of my age and how pessimistic they were about the future of South Korea. And the fact is that Britain's relations with Korea at that time were tenuous. Although there had been formal diplomatic relations, uh, first established in 1883, unlike most other parts of Asia, Korea largely escaped the impact of British imperialism in the late 19th century. Other than a very curious episode in 1885, when without a buy or leave, we seized a Korean island called Kumundo, uh, and we converted it into a naval base called Port ha Hamilton for a couple of years while we prepared for a possible war against Russia. But other than that, Korea uh, didn't really feel the impact uh, of the British. It certainly felt the impact of the Japanese. Um, when Japan finally seized the Korean Peninsula at the beginning of the 20th century, the British did virtually nothing to protest. Indeed, it saw Japan at that time as a strategic ally in the region uh, and until, under US pressure, the Anglo-Japanese Treaty was revoked in 1923. Korea was therefore left to suffer from fairly brutal uh, Japanese colonial rule from 1910 to 19, 1945. And by the 1930s, the Japanese were being pretty ruthless about expelling such few British companies who had invested in the peninsula. And of course, the Korean War didn't encourage many UK firms to try and re-enter Korea after independence. So the truth is that the British presence in Korea took the form of a token military presence in the UN forces, but essentially Korea was part of the American sphere of influence and very remote from British foreign policy or public concerns. Now, I finally visited Korea itself in the 1970s as a young trade official, and the situation had suddenly changed quite dramatically, and it was almost by accident. The then Korean president, Park Jong-hee, had asked Chairman Chung Ju-yong of Hyundai in 1971 to build a shipyard in Ulsan, which was then a small fishing village. He wanted to emulate uh, Japanese industrial prowess. Understandably, Chairman Chung turned uh, first to the Japanese shipyards for technical and financial assistance. He was given a pretty dusty answer. So he scoured the world looking for a partner and quite unexpectedly, he found the solution to his problem in Britain. The Appledore Shipbuilding Company in Devon, I'm not joking, the Appledore Shipbuilding Company in Devon was signed up as a technical partner to help him design his new shipyard. And ECGD and Lazards put together the finance which allowed Hyundai uh, to build the very first ship ever built in uh, Korea, it was a Greek tanker, and scores of British maritime engineers suddenly appeared in Korea to help get the project off the ground, and that was the start of the world's largest shipbuilding industry. So it wasn't a surprise when, boosted by this experience, Chairman Chung Ju-yong again turned to the UK uh, 
a few years later to help him launch Korea's first automobile factory. He recruited George Turnbull from British Leyland and received invaluable technical help from the Japanese component, uh, sorry, the British component manufacturers to launch his first model, the Pony. The Japanese industry was scornful and totally unhelpful, but the British were only too pleased to help the Koreans. Little did they realize at the time that they were laying the foundations of one of the world's greatest car industries. So the 1970s saw an explosion in UK-Korea commercial relations. GC helped build Korea's first nuclear power station at Cori. British banks began to open up in Seoul for the first time. Um, large numbers of British firms began to visit the market. We created a UK-Korea Economic Cooperation Council and British ministers, again for the first time, began to visit Seoul on a regular basis. And that, for me, is the real turning point in Britain's bilateral relations with Korea. They were no longer solely focused on political and military times. For the first time, large numbers of ordinary British people began to conduct business in Korea, and as the miracle of the Han gathered pace, so the numbers of Korean students, academics, and business representatives coming to Britain began to grow to serious numbers. Now, Chairman Chung of Hyundai and his brother, Chung Se-yung, became very close and extraordinarily generous friends of Britain. And British business delegations to Seoul were frequently entertained uh, at lavish Kiseng parties, Kiseng being roughly the Korean equivalent of a Japanese geisha. And I, as you can imagine, these events were extremely popular and much looked forward to until in 1978, the then Secretary of State for Trade, leading the British business delegation, suddenly got up in the middle of the dinner and walked out with his private secretary. Now, to this day, nobody knows exactly what his Kiseng girl had done to him, but the embarrassment on both sides, you can imagine, was mortifying. Needless to say, that was the last of the UK career Kiseng parties in Seoul, and somehow the momentum in bilateral trade relations slowed very considerably over the next decade. By the time I returned to Korea again in 1994 as British ambassador, the state of the Korean economy had been totally transformed. By then, Korea had joined the rest of the world. Years of double-digit economic growth had replaced those refugee squatter camps, I recall from my first visit to Seoul, with a vibrant modern city and a new generation of young South Koreans who had only the most distant memories of what their parents had gone through. By the time I got there, two-thirds of Koreans had been born after the Korean War. Um, my very first VIP visitor from London was appropriately given tonight, um, the then Lord Mayor of London. Sir Paul Newell. Now, he threw himself into a strenuous program of calls and visits, and he subsequently became a, a, a long-term friend and supporter of Korea in this country. But for me, the most important meeting uh, he held was with the mayor of Seoul, who told us that the city would be celebrating the 800th anniversary of its foundation the following year, and that triggered an idea. The next year, we organized a major program of promotional events designed to promote British business, education, tourism, and science. We called it Britain Salutes Seoul 800. I promise you, it sounded much better in Korean. Michael Heseltine came out to launch the program. It was an enormous success. And that, in some ways, symbolized um, my stint as an ambassador. I was a very lucky ambassador. Um, my period coincided with a period of unrelenting economic growth and prosperity. The number of Korean students studying at Korean universities in my three and a half years quadrupled. The volume of bilateral trade more than doubled. University and research links exploded. All the major chaebol, the conglo conglomerates of Korea, announced major direct investments in the UK. British Airways opened up direct flights to Seoul. Marks and Spencer's opened up in Korea. 
In my first year in Seoul, I had one visiting British minister. By my last year, I received 14 British ministers, including the then Prime Minister, John Major. We were on a roll. And within six months of my departure, it all came crashing to a halt. The Asian, for, I left in the spring of 97, in the autumn of 97, uh, the Asian financial crisis started. And it was a traumatic experience for Korea and the Koreans. Middle class families who'd sent their children in increasing numbers to British boarding schools and universities had to pull them back home in humiliation and distress. Several of these major Korean investments we thought we'd secured, such as the LG's, Clavaux's plants in South Wales, simply vanished. Business dried up as the Korean economy faced bankruptcy. By that time, I'd returned to London, but I followed with enormous interest, and I have to say admiration, the way in which the Korean authorities and people responded to what they quite inaccurately still call the IMF crisis. Unlike the Japanese, who um, by that time had spent a decade floundering around in the face of the downturn they'd experienced from the late 1980s, the Koreans embarked on a radical, painful, but ultimately very successful transformation. They reformed and bailed out their banking industry. They changed their laws on foreign investment. They started from scratch, establishing one of the world's leading broadband IT systems. There were rapid changes in um, economic policy. Um, and as Korea um, joined the OECD at about the same time, there was a steady erosion of the protectionism which had marked Korea in the earlier periods. And then at the height of the Asian financial crisis, to the amazement of the Koreans, the Queen paid a state visit. Now, ordinary Koreans had no idea that this visit had actually been in preparation for years. All they knew was that the Queen of England had recognized their crisis and had come personally to extend the hand of friendship during a time of what was great national distress. And it was one of the most successful state visits ever undertaken by the monarch. My own visits to uh, Korea resumed after I left the Foreign Office in 2004 and I joined Standard Chartered Bank where I work now. And again, by one of those coincidences, within a few months of arriving in the bank, we made the largest ever investment in Korea by any British company. We acquired Korea First Bank, which had run into difficulties during the Asian financial crisis, and we suddenly found ourselves running uh, one of Korea's largest domestic banks. I was lucky enough to be appointed to the board of that bank in Korea, and that gave me an excuse to go back to visiting the country what, probably half a dozen times a year. And it also gave me an opportunity to participate in a variety of bilateral organizations, of which the most important and successful was the UK Korea Forum for the Future, which met alternately in Seoul and London for 17 years, until very sadly brought to an end by the FCO last year. Over the last decade, the most important development in bilateral relations has probably been the conclusion of the EU-Korea Free Trade Agreement in 2011, an agreement that certainly my bank and the City of London generally lobbied very hard uh, to, to see signed and implemented. And that agreement uh, has virtually eliminated most of the formal barriers to trading goods. And perhaps for the City of London more important, it has opened up the Korean market to a range of professional services, such, for example, for the legal profession in Britain now can, uh, can operate in Korea in a way that it couldn't in the past. It has led to a dramatic increase in bilateral trade. This and other developments have changed bilateral relations between Korea and Britain quite dramatically. Um, compared to the period from 1970 to the Asian financial crisis, in that earlier period, Korea was enjoying rapid economic growth 
largely because it was in the catch-up phase of economic development. Millions of Koreans at that time left the land and moved into apartment blocks in the cities. Their lives were immensely improved, as for the first time ever, this urbanization process transforms productivity levels uh, and the nature of Korean society. Korea, in the 1950s, when those guys were out there, was an agricultural peasant society. Today, as they know, um, today it's a modern, prosperous, high-tech, democratic country, um, which is why we owe the veterans so much. In that period, Britain was important to Korea precisely because we were seen as a source of technology, education, and as a partner in Europe. Essentially, Korea during that period was focused on emulating the Japanese development model to achieve rapid economic growth. After the Asian financial crisis, that Japanese model and was no longer relevant. I mean, the Koreans realized very soon in the second half of the 1990s uh, that to continue to model their business structure on the Japanese model was a cul-de-sac. Korean firms could only prosper if they moved towards Anglo-Saxon type capitalism, if they became truly global players, a process that President Kim Young-sam described as Segewa, a form of a Korean expression for globalization. And the largest Korean conglomerates uh, proceeded to, to implement fundamental reforms. They stopped being essentially subcontractors, OEMs, uh, and they moved and challenged for the first time the Japanese, the Americans, the Germans um, on their own terms and have become, over the last decade and a half, global world-beating suppliers of, you name it, you know, Samsung mobile phones, IT systems, cars, whole range of consumer durables. And that transition um, required a very different mindset from the single-minded emphasis on investment and production that there had been. It required much more sophisticated marketing tools and much greater awareness of, of consumer demands uh, in the rest of the world. But it also created some problems within Korean society because although Korea has made a, a very, very successful transformation, it has also seen within its society um, some increasing stresses. Wage growth has begun to slow. Sound familiar? Soaring household indebtedness, thanks largely to the extraordinary amounts of money that Koreans spend on housing and education. We'll come back so we can come back to education. The costs of education in Korea are amazing. The savings rates, which used to be one of the highest in the world, is now one of the lowest. And the population is no longer replacing itself. Korea is on a demographic trajectory of a falling uh, population, falling uh, working age population. And all these factors um, mean that although viewed from the outside, Korea's continue to be a very successful economy, for many people inside the country, there's a sense of growing inequality, failing consumption growth, and some lack of confidence in the economic, social, and political models um, which had served Korea so well in the past. And that growing domestic self-criticism manifested itself most sharply this year in the aftermath of the tragedy on the 16th of April, uh, when the ferry Sewol sank with 476 mainly young people on board. Now that disaster, and it's a disaster by any standard, but what was interesting about it was that it led to a national bout of angry soul searching, not just targeted on the captain and his crew, and who are now before a court in Seoul, not just for the government authorities, but for the whole nation. What kind of country is this, the Korean national media 
demanded. And many foreigners, um, deeply impressed by his career's economic and technological progress, were quite taken aback by this fierce reaction. But to many Koreans, particularly the youngsters, the sinking of the Sewol was a symbol of a society marked by inequality, growing social divisions, and unrelenting pressure to achieve success in what is one of the most challenging educational systems in the world. And it has reinforced a populist backlash which was already evident in Korea in the run-up to the last presidential election. Now, for British investors trying to do business in Korea, these new political attitudes have manifested themselves in a disturbing trend towards populist policies, which have sought to replace market forces by increased regulation. As fast as the economy discarded the old protectionist trade policies that marked the early stage of industrialization, so they have appeared to be replaced by increasing government intervention in the way that firms can manage their businesses. As the Chaebol, Korea's enormous conglomerates, have increasingly started investing outside Korea, um, it's proving difficult uh, to get the Korean services sector and SMEs to take up the slack. And according to McKinsey's productivity levels in the services sector in Korea are some 40% below the levels reached in manufacturing. So Korea has not made that transition that most other developed countries have made from manufacturing to services. And my experience over the last few years with the Korean banking industry um, illustrates some of these problems. Now, Korea has had one of the most disciplined workforces um, which has served it well during the early stages of industrialization. I mean, I remember back in the 70s, I mean, to visit a Korean factory was like m visiting a military barracks. I mean, really, it was military-style discipline. The hours were grueling, absolutely grueling. The hard work. But it was also a highly inflexible labor market, which makes it very difficult for management today to shift from the traditional system of promotion by seniority to one based on performance. Now, my bank, Standard Chartered, operates in um, about 70 different markets around the world. The only one over the last decade in which we've had to face a nine-week strike by unions opposed to change uh, was in Korea. And we have seen the growing cost of regulatory intervention in the financial services sector in Korea. We've seen rising loan impairment, that is people not paying their debts, aided and encouraged by government policy. Um, loan impairment in both consumer and corporate lending, which has led to a return on equity in the Korean banking sector as a whole, which is not only amongst the lowest in Asia, but below the cost of capital. And by treating the banking industry as if it were a utility rather than as a potentially profitable growth sector able to generate jobs, Korea's regulators have left its banking industry um, today accounting for only 5% of GDP. Now you compare that with 10% in Taiwan, 15% in Singapore and 26% in Hong Kong, you realize how far Korea is um, behind. And I'm afraid, not surprisingly, there's been a growing exodus from the market of some of the major British financial institutions who had invested in uh, Korea over the last few decades. HSBC is closing its relatively small but nevertheless significant consumer banking business. My own bank was uh, forced to take a billion dollar write-off last summer and we've just sold off our small savings bank and capital companies in Korea. Aviva have sold their 47% of their joint venture to a private equity fund. ING Life Insurance has pulled out of the market. This is a terrible blow, a terrible blow to the bilateral relationship. There were, not so many years ago, hopes that Seoul might emerge as a global financial centre and that the City of London could play a major role in that evolution. But I'm afraid those hopes are fading. 
But despite these serious flaws, Korea still has significant fundamental strengths. Its education levels are amongst the highest in the world. Its people still work extraordinarily hard. Gender discrimination and Confucian attitudes in the workplace are slowly eroding. And when persuaded that change is essential in the national interest, Korean politicians, unlike the Japanese, are capable of pushing through fundamental reforms in a very short order. Indeed, I think it can be argued that disasters like the furry sinking, and there were similar disasters when I was in Korea. I remember a bridge over the River Han collapsing in the rush hour, and I remember a de department store, a, a sloppily, poorly constructed department store uh, collapsing. So, you know, the ferry disaster is not a first in Korea. But I don't think that reflects the political ills within the society so much as the characteristics of the Korean personality, which in other contexts we admire. Once Koreans make up their mind to do something, they will work relentlessly to achieve their target in the shortest possible time. The Koreans themselves have got a phrase to describe this phenomenon, bali bali, which means roughly cutting every corner to get things done as soon as possible. And that drive and work ethic um, has transformed a country which has got no natural resources into a world leader and a range of modern technologies. And the Koreans can no more change those national characteristics and personality traits than the British can stop their constant self-deprecation. It's, it's in the psyche. So I remain optimistic about Korea. Unlike some of its neighbors, it has a vibrant democracy, a can-do spirit, and a political system that doesn't prevaricate endlessly. Today, Korea is genuinely a global economic power, and the potential is there uh, in a whole range of sectors. There are opportunities to be seized, particularly in services, health, financial, professional services, tourism. And whenever my optimism about Korea, and I really am optimistic about Korea, whenever it falters, when we face another problem in Korea, and I think, oh God, you know what we can do about this, I just think of their neighbors. I just think of North Korea. Because one constant feature of Britain's relations with Korea has been that the UK has remained a resolute supporter of the Republic of Korea, the South Korea, as it deals with the bellicosity of its neighbor from the North. We really do share a deep concern about the appalling human rights record of the DPRK. And we look, along with our allies, for the complete, verifiable and irreversible denuclearization of North Korea. But we're still looking for the key to turning North Korea into a responsible member of the international community. Now, I've only visited North Korea once. I went there in March 2010, and like all foreign visitors to that country, my visit was closely monitored and controlled by the North Korean authorities. And like all visitors, I came away baffled by the most authoritarian regime in the world. Nothing you read about North Korea can adequately prepare you for the shock of a country which combines advanced nuclear technology capability with an economic system that cannot feed its people. We simply don't know how many North Koreans died during the famines of the 1990s or how many hundreds of thousands are still today incarcerated in camps, in camps which make Stalin's gulags look like holiday camps. And I thought, <clears throat> if you'll bear with me, I'll just give you a flavor of how different North Korea is from that flourishing democracy south of the DMZ. Uh, and if I may, I'd just like to read you a couple of extracts from some notes I wrote immediately after I got back to London about the impressions I had formed in March 2010. I wrote, you don't see many bicycles in Pyongyang. Most people walk in their thousands. There are some Soviet era trams and trolley buses, but there are very long queues for them. You don't get heating in most public buildings. They're freezing. The hotel where the foreigners stay was warm, but it was clear that the North Koreans normally wear 
coats, jumpers and scarves at meetings at this time of the year. You don't get much lighting either. The streets and blocks of flats are pitch black at night. Uh, you see people going to work out of these enormous apartment blocks. There's no electricity. Several of the tourist shops we were taken to had to rush around to find someone to switch on the lights for us. You do see gangs of soldiers often looking no more than 13 years old. And the reason they only look 13 years old is because they're malnourished. Uh, something like a third of young uh, North Koreans um, suffer from acute malnourishment. So we saw gangs of soldiers and civilians working in the fields and on the streets with some shovels, brooms and pickaxes. But in a whole week in North Korea, I never saw a cultivator or a piece of mechanical digging equipment. There are no traffic lights in Pyongyang. Such vehicles as there are, and there are not many, on the very wide streets are directed by girls in military uniform. And we were told by our minders that there are no private traders in DPRK. To their embarrassment, we passed inadvertently by a local street market the next day with people openly selling items placed in front of them on the ground. What they're selling, I don't know, because our minders refused to stop the coach to let us look. It's quite impossible to understand fully a country which is so cut off from the rest of the world and so obsessively secretive. Visitors at that time uh, could not take in their mobile phones or Blackberries. The local corporations we met appeared to have no access to the internet although apparently it was possible to send an email uh, if you went down to a post office, rather like sending a telegram. The local mobile phone service uh, could not handle overseas calls. There were only three radio stations, all blasting out agitprop and Soviet-style music. It was clear from our meetings that uh, a directive had gone out to urgently seek new sources of foreign exchange, but... I have to say, I always felt sorry for the firms we met. They had so little understanding of how business is done outside the uh, DPRK. Nobody in their right mind would do business in North Korea. But the North Koreans resolutely refused to accept that perhaps the Chinese model might provide them with a way forward. And when we asked some pretty obvious questions, such as, who's going to succeed? the dear leader, at that time, Kim Jong-il. They looked shocked, and then they evaded the answer. We do not think about that, they said. Or they simply lied. And on the day I flew out of Pyongyang, the North Koreans attacked a South Korean corvette, the Chonan, with the loss of 46 young South Korean sailors. I personally have no wish ever to return to the DPRK. During the course of my lifetime, South Korea has been the first country in the world ever to go from being a major recipient of Western aid. Now it's a major OECD donor in developing countries. It's weathered the latest Lehman Brothers financial crisis better than most other developed countries. And as I said before, it's now a world leader in a host of high-tech industries. Its universities pour out a stream of brilliant scientists and engineers and as you know, the heads of both the United Nations and the World Bank were both born in South Korea. K-pop, other Korean cultural offerings have swept Asia and arrived very firmly on the shores of this country, not least uh, in the context of the City of London Festival this year. It's now over 60 years since my dinner ladies told me to clear my plate. And thank God, British and Korean links are immeasurably, immeasurably closer than they ever were before. Today, we work closely with the Koreans on a whole range of policy issues, climate change, cybersecurity, overseas development, which we wouldn't even thought about even 10 years ago. And our bilateral trade relationship, thanks in part to that free trade agreement, has grown now to over $7 billion a year in goods alone. And I'm absolutely delighted that today there are 17,000 young Koreans studying in Britain and about a thousand British students who go to Korea, Korean universities each year. Korean art and culture are now an important part of the London scene and 
Those of you who've been down there know that New Malden has developed into a vibrant outpost of the Korean diaspora. Last November, President Park made a state visit to London, um, which for those of you lucky enough to be there included a magnificent dinner given by the City Corporation in her honour at the Guild Hall. And that visit was an indication of the way in which relations by the two countries have changed so deeply during the course of my lifetime. And looking back over the years, I think that's my abiding memory. It's of a relationship with Korea which has become immeasurably more rewarding, more balanced, more complex. We now look to Korea for the sort of technology, research and economic partnership that they looked to us for in the 1970s. Over the next few years, Korea will host the Winter Olympics in 2018, and I have absolutely no doubt will continue to punch above its weight in international diplomacy. As I look back to my early contacts with Korea, I realize just how much our values have converged, how immensely more complicated our bilateral relations have become, but there's still a lot more to be done. I look forward to the day when British holidaymakers take vacations in Korea as often as they do in other Asian countries. I look forward to the day when British journalists extend their coverage of Korea beyond the latest North Korean sabre rattling. I look forward to the day when the Koreans stop thinking the British are conservative gentlemen who live in a perpetual fog. That'll be the day. <laughs> so what were the Korean British relationship look like in another 60 years? I, of course, don't know, but I hope our children and our grandchildren get as much pleasure out of the growing links between the two countries at opposite ends of the Eurasian landmass as I've done. One last point. Our two countries have one more thing in common. By last night, both England and South Korea <laughs> had been ousted from the World Cup without having won a single game in the group stages. I think we should look to each other for solace, sympathy and comfort at a time of mutual grief. Thank you very much.